Good evening, everyone. My name is Francisco Boschel, and I'm an analyst in the field of uh, standard certification and innovation at the International Renewable Energy Agency. And it is my pleasure to represent today with my colleagues, Arina Anisi and Alessandra Salgado, our agency to provide this lecture on innovation driving the energy sector transformation. So I understand that we will give the, basically the lecture and then we keep the Q&A for the end. So if you have questions throughout the presentation, please write them down don't, so you don't forget them. And at the end, we'll make sure that we can hopefully address all your questions. So let us start. Let's see if this works. Good innovation. <laughs> I don't know if everyone is familiar with the, our agency, but just to give you a brief introduction. So we are an intergovernmental agency. So it means that our stakeholders are governments and uh, mainly represented by the ministries of energy, sometimes foreign affairs, or economy, climate change. And uh, we were established in 2011, so it means that we are six years old, so we are not so old, we are still kind of uh, infants. Um, but anyway, we are growing very fast. At the moment, we have already 153 member countries. So basically all the ones that you see in dark blue in the map are already members of IRENA, and we have co close to 30 countries which are in the process of accession. So are the ones in, 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 in light uh, uh, blue. And we have some other countries which have not started the process yet, but we hope they will start soon. So as you can see, uh, it's close to uh, universal membership. We have uh, many countries in uh, America, Africa very well represented, basically the whole Europe, including the European Union also is a member, Russia, China, India, so all uh, big emerging economies still missing. The big ones that you see there, Brazil and Canada, but hopefully they will join soon. And our headquarters are in Abu Dhabi, in the United Arab Emirates, but we have our innovation and technology center here in Germany, in Bonn. So just a few kilometers from here. Let's start with the content now. So let's, I would like to start maybe with the energy transition because that is what we are uh, supposed to talk today, innovation for the energy transformation. Actually here in Germany, maybe you have heard this term before in German, no? the Energiewende, no? uh, the energy transformation. So what is this energy transformation about? Maybe the first thing to keep in mind is that energy as such is not really a product that you consume, no? It's more a service. So when you discuss about innovation, uh, you can think, for example, my new iPad is cool, my new iPhone is cool, my new, I don't know, laptop is, is cool, no? But actually, the electricity coming from the plug, pff, I mean, if it comes from a wind turbine, a coal power plant, yeah? I mean, it's not, nothing that I really think, okay, is, is it cool or not, no? Whatever, I mean, what is cool is really what I, a use with this uh, electricity, and more important than that, the service that provides to society, right? So why are we in this process of the energy transformation? More than an energy transformation, it's really a social process. It's a social transformation, and it's supported by policies and also enabled by technology. And why are we going through this transformation? Because we as humans, we want more development, and we want, of course, welfare for all, yeah? And we have discovered throughout the time that there are many things that cover this welfare. We want more sustainable growth, so we want more jobs, GDP growth, I want my child to be better educated, etc. I also want human development, no? Of course, I don't want uh, people lacking basic services like uh, potable water, healthcare, etc. I don't want also to ruin my, con my, my planet, no? I don't want to destroy where I'm living, my, my, my dwelling, my household, yeah? Which is this planet. So basically, all of these transformation improvements actually have a link to energy because energy is kind of the enabler for many of these activities. 
So actually, this energy transformation that we are discussing is not so much about putting wind turbines and putting PV panels. It's actually about transform our, uh, transforming our society and get it better. And what we see here is these famous sustainable development goals. And uh, there are 17, quite a number, you know, uh, including everything that we have discussed, economic growth, poverty, uh, food, agriculture, etc. But actually, there is a, a link between each one of those and energy at the end of the day. So energy is an enabler, and actually what we want is now a more cleaner, affordable, local, yeah? so we don't depend from foreign sources of energy, but I can harness my own energy locally, an abundant source of energy. Now, when we discuss about, it sounds like very innovative, this thing about energy transformation, but actually in society we have seen energy transformations many times before. This is not the first time we go through the energy vending, yeah? Maybe if we go through the more typical ones, yeah, basically we as humans started basically with the wood. That was maybe our first uh, source of energy that was widely used. But then in the 18th century, we came with this industrial revolution, no? And then people start discovering that these rocks called coal were also coming from partial burning of, of, of wood or peat, also produce energy. And it was good to use, uh, to produce a steam, so water vapor, and with that we could run, uh, run machines that produce textiles and other things. So the first or the second energy transformation I, I will mention today is the pit and coal. It was around the 18th century. Then in the 19th century, at the end of the 19th century, someone dig a hole in the US and this black thing started to uh, emerge from there and they discovered that you can also burn that. And it's called oil. And with that, basically, they discovered that at that time, actually, we used to, to use whale oil, so oil coming from whales for lamps and for other purposes. And we discovered that actually oil was even a better, uh, more efficient way to, to, to uh, light our houses, etc., heating our houses. So instead of uh, whale oil, we start to using fossil oil. Yeah? And when the automobile came into the picture, then the demand just boomed and the oil basically conquered the world. Then, in the mid of the last century, we had natural gas. So we discovered that this gas that was coming with the oil, we could also use it, and we can also, uh, it was even maybe cheaper and less uh, dirty than the, uh, oil. So we had another transformation there. And nowadays, what is what we are seeing? The last one, maybe. The renewable energy transformation. So now we discovered that actually we don't need to burn anything that is uh, buried in our planet. Actually, we can harness energy from many other sources which are uh, more abundant. Actually, not, uh, we will never run out of this type of, of energy and we can use it in a cleaner way. Now, it's very difficult to predict when all of this happened and why it happened. No? For example, many people in the 80s discuss about the transformation based on nuclear power. I, we haven't seen it yet, no? Or transformation based on hydrogen. We haven't seen it yet, no? Will it come, will it not come? We really don't know. But what we know is that actually renewables is coming into the picture. Now, the other big debate that we have at the moment is the climate change debate, and that we are emitting greenhouse gases which are making our planet more uh, warmer and actually can create natural disasters. The objective that we as humans have set politically is that we should try to keep this warming below two degrees Celsius to avoid catastrophic, let's say, repercussions in the future. But what we know at the moment is that we are, and now I'm talking about a few numbers here, but bear with me. So at the moment we are emitting around what we call gigatons of CO2, around 32 gigatons of CO2 per year, yeah? What we should, reduce, let's say by 2050, is to close to actually five gigatons per year if we want to keep this threshold of the two degrees. However, if we continue, so if we make the calculation, it means that in the whole century, so till the end of this century, we cannot emit in total more than around 800 gigatons. But at the current rate that we are emitting CO2, actually we will consume our whole carbon budget 
even by before the mid of this century. By 2040, basically, we, we are uh, already consuming on, so basically, yeah, we are doomed. But there are some good news, and actually is that if we continue with this rate of de deploying renewables and improving energy efficiency, actually we can reduce in uh, the mid of this century 90% of the emissions that we need to actually meet this two degrees Celsius objective. In the, now let's think that energy is electricity, but it's all, also other uses of energy. But let's talk first now only about electricity. And there are some good news in the electricity sector in terms of renewables. For example, 2016 was a, a, a record year for renewables, renewable power, so renewable electricity in many ways. There were more than 162 gigawatts of renewable energy uh, installed capacity, mainly from PV and wind, but also some hydro, bioenergy, and geothermal. And what are these uh, gigawatts, maybe for those who are not uh, in the energy sector? So to give a perspective, for example, um, a country like, like mine, like Colombia, we have a total electricity capacity in my country of 15 gigawatts. Yeah? So in just one year, we have installed 10 times the total installed capacity of a country like Colombia just in renewables. Yeah? A country like, for example, Brazil, which has more than uh, close to 200 million inhabitants, they have an installed capacity of 150 gigawatts. So again, even for a country of the magnitude of Brazil, we have installed in one year more renewable power than the whole uh, electricity capacity of a country like Brazil. Also, we reach another interesting threshold. We have now a cumulative, so in total, more than 2,000 gigawatts. This is interesting because actually the total installed capacity of electricity based on coal is 1,999 gigawatts. So last year, we actually surpassed renewables, has surpassed coal as the main source of electricity in the world. And more than 162 countries now have in place policies to deploy renewables and support renewable energy. When I joined IRENA four years ago, only 64 countries had policies in place to promote renewables. So in just four or five years, more than 100 countries have also put in place now policies to promote renewables. In terms of investment, also good news. The dark blue is renewables, the gray one is fossil fuels. And these are the investment, uh, yeah, installed capacity per each technology. And what we can see is that in the year uh, 2012, we had a turning point. Now we are installing more renewables per year than fossils. It means that more investments, more money is going to renewables than fossil uh, power. For example, last year we invested more than uh, 240 US uh, billions, in, mainly in solar PV and wind. Yeah? Again, to put this in perspective, a country like, uh, like Ecuador has a GDP of around 60 US billion, yeah? So it means that in one year again, we have invested in renewable power four times the GDP of a country like Ecuador, yeah? So the, the amount of money that is going into renewables now is massive. In cost reduction, also very good news, we continue to reduce cost of, of uh, renewable technologies dramatically. Maybe the most uh, dramatic case is PV. PV is this one in yellow, and what you see is here is the range of cost in the year 2010, and here the range of cost of PV in 2016. But the interesting part is this blue, uh, sorry, white uh, line, which is the weighted average cost of, of PV. And what we see is that on average, the cost of PV has decreased in just Four, uh, sorry, six years, more than 80%, 80% cost reduction. And that's why we are seeing now so much uh, investment, so, so many investments, so many deployment of renewables, because it's becoming even more competitive than, for example, fossil power. Fossil power is, the range of cost of fossil power is this gray band here. If you can see, most of the renewable energy technologies now are as competitive or even more competitive, like hydropower or onshore wind, than fossil uh, power. So this is also a transformation not only driven by 
yeah, uh, let's say, uh, good spirit and philanthropy. It's actually a business case. But despite that, in the power sector, we have very good news. The truth is that, as I mentioned before, energy is not only electricity. Energy is also all other types of uh, uses, heat, transportation, industries. And to be honest, we still continue to be an economy, global economy, driven by fossil fuels. So more than or close to 80% of our economy is run by fossil fuels and just 20% by renewables. So good news in the power sector, but still we need to do a lot more. So this is a little bit the introduction about this energy transformation. So now what is the role of innovation in transforming this energy sector? So coming back again to the picture of the global CO2 emissions. This is the, the global CO2 emissions in the year 2015. And you can see that the main share of, of CO2 emissions are coming from the power sector, the energy in the power sector, so for electricity. And the, the other uh, uh, two thirds of the pie are energy used in transport, yeah? so in cars, on planes, ships, in buildings, so for heating, cooking, air conditioning, and in industrial processes. Yeah? Now, as, as I mentioned before, we know that in the power sector we are doing every day better. And we can, so the first part that we need to do is to continue to innovate to make this power technology, so PV, wind, etc., more competitive and integrate more of this power in power systems. But the big problem is in other areas. And we see here some areas which are um, a little bit darker and with these lines, dashed lines here. This is mainly industry and transport. And why they are a big problem? Because actually nowadays we don't have commercially available renewable technology options for these sectors. Here we are talking about a chemical and petrochemical sector, production of cement, production of iron and steel, aviation, shipping. For all of those, actually at the moment, there is no technology commercially available to introduce renewables in this sector. So we need innovation actually to come with these breakthroughs from the industry and the transport sector. So without innovation, yeah, we are in big, big trouble. So if we want really to decarbonize these sectors, we need to increase, of course, the share of renewables in all of them. And it's not a small increase. So here what we see is that for each one of the, the sector, transport, industry, buildings, and power, some of the key technologies that we will need. Uh, for example, in the case of transport, biogas, which is biomethane for running, for example, ships or buses. Biokerosene, which is basically jet fuel, so it's for uh, aviation. Liquid biofuels for transport and electric vehicles, so to use renewable power in cars. The blue part is what we have deployed uh, in, in different units, so in the, in the case, for example, of biofuels, is in liters of biofuels per year in the year 2015. The uh, yellow one is what we will need in 2030, and the green one is what we will need in 2050 if we want to decarbonize these sectors. And we see that, for example, in the case of liquid biofuels, we need an increase of seven times what we have at the moment. So it sounds, yeah, maybe we can do it. But for example, in the case of uh, jet fuel, we need to increase what we, have, we are producing at the moment by more than, and I need to look at the number, close to 20,000 times what we have at the moment. 20,000 times, yeah? In other sectors, it's similar. So for example, in the power sector, yeah, we need to continue to increase solar and wind, maybe 20 times, 10 times. But for example, a concentrated solar power or batteries for electricity purposes more than 100 times, 20,000 times. So the challenge is still huge for many of these sectors. But again, there are some good news. And it's that we used to always underestimate renewables. And renewables are very quiet, but they are, doing, uh, they are actually creating a lot of disruption in the system. How do we know that? If we see this, this is a story from MIT from 2015, and all these lines that you see here were the projections of solar PV capacity uh, in different years. So for example, the IAA in the year 2006, they 
projected that uh, solar PV will grow at this rate. Yeah? Uh, now, the IEA has been increasing these projections every year. So, in 2008, they said, you know what, PV is doing better, so maybe they will grow like this. And two years, no, they are doing really well. Maybe they will grow like this. They are doing really fine now, so maybe like this. So every year, they are saying that, okay, renewables are doing much better than what I thought. And the black dot is actually what is happening in reality. And what you see is that what is happening in reality is even much better than what all of these agencies has, have predicted. Now, actually, this one only goes to 2012, more or less. We are in 2017 now, and I can tell you, in 2017, PV is around 300. So actually, the, the black dot for 2017, which is more or less here, should be somewhere here. So again, much better than what anyone has predicted. Yeah? Actually, PV, for example, has grown at a rate of 47% per year. If we just continue with this growth rate, yeah, it means that by 2030, we will have grown, in contrast to 2017, more than 220 times, yeah? while actually we need a growth of 20 times. Yeah? So what I'm trying to say here is that if we, continue with, if we just continue with this trend that we are observing at the moment, we will actually surpass what we think that we need in terms of PV deployment. Yeah? So, Maybe this is also something interesting to think is that the growth that we are seeing at the moment is much faster than what anyone expected. Now, innovation is actually, to reach this, we need to innovate, yeah, but not only in technology, so definitely we need better technologies, but actually to make these technologies available, we need also to innovate in the business models, in the new market structures, in the enabling infrastructure like grids, ICT, etc., and in the policy and regulation that will make these technologies available in the energy system. So innovation is not only about technology. Innovation is also about business, it's about markets, it's about policies. And covers the whole technology life cycle. So innovation, again, is not only about research and development. It's not only about R&D. It's also about piloting, creating markets, and commercializing these technologies. And we will see now how this is reflected in the case of renewables. Let's start with the early stages of innovation, so research, development, and demonstration. This is the case, for example, of wind energy. The first wind uh, turbine for electricity production actually happened or was built in the 19th century, 1888, by a, a very smart guy called Herb Brush. And actually, he sold his stocks later to a company that now we know as General Electric. Actually, he was the first one to build this. And he built this uh, wind turbine, which was 70 meter height and has a rated power of 12 kilowatts. Yeah? Now, in 2017, we have wind turbines which have a rotor diameter of 164 meters, yeah? So almost 10 times this scale. So if we see a picture of this, basically the height of, uh, of, of one of these wind turbines is more than two football pitches together, yeah? And a rated power of 9,000 kilowatts, yeah? So, in a matter of a century, we came with a machine which was basically some like a hobby thing to actually something that is just humongous <laughs> and can actually, with this, with just one of these wind turbines, you actually can light more than 10,000 homes in a country like uh, UK with the consumption of a country like the UK, for example. And of course, we think that in the future we will see actually Turbines like this floating in the ocean, pumping water, producing, sending back electricity to, to, to land, and this actually is coming very soon. So how did we get from here to there? So the question is, what was the driver behind this? So in the case of wind turbines, basically what pushed this was mainly two things. One was the so-called energy security. So in Europe, they were very concerned about 
importing fuels and they wanted to have a source of energy that actually farmers could have locally and not depend on a fuel that was imported and volatile in price. And second, the crisis of uh, the oil crisis in the 70s, which increased the price of oil tremendously. So actually that was kind of the key driver for this technology. And what we have learned, well, we have learned quite a lot. We learned, for example, that actually it was not such a good idea to have so many blades in a, in a wind turbine, that actually just three blades is the most robust design that you can have. You learn also that actually steel uh, towers with a form of a, of a cone are the best kind of uh, towers you can have. So we have learned quite a number of things. So how is this learning process working? Actually, we are humans, we are engineers, we have different ways to, to learn. We can learn by searching, and this is basically R&D. And this is, for example, the case of PV. In PV, we had a lot of research. In, in actually the early 20th century, we discovered that actually this uh, light could produce electricity to the uh, photo photons, or the photon effect, we could produce electricity. But it took a long way till around the 1950s, we produced the first PV cell in a laboratory. Yeah? And then it took quite some time until there was a niche market for this. So yeah, this is pretty cool, but how we are going to use this? I mean, we have already electricity. I connect to the plug. Why do I need to do this? Well, we found out when the, 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 actually the aerospace uh, competition between the US and, and the Soviet Union that started, they discovered that to run these satellites in the space, of course, you cannot have a, a cable so long that you can plug a satellite to the Earth. So you needed a source of electricity that was uh, uh, available in the space. They say, okay, how do we do it? Okay, let's put PV panels there, and then we just produce electricity from the sun. And actually, this was the niche market that make all the development to have actually a PV panel that then could be used back in the Earth. So in the 1980s, we start to see PV panels on uh, the roofs. And now in the 2000s, the big boom here in Germany with the feed-in tariffs and more and more PV. So R&D is a way to learn, but keep in mind, it takes time. So actually, the process since we started using, we have the first PV until we have this boom, was more than six decades. So, yeah, innovation is very good, very important, but we need to hurry up today to have the solutions for this cement sector, steel sector, and so on, in the next 15, 20 years. The other way to learn is by just doing it, no? And that was the kind of wind turbines. Actually, this development of wind turbines started in Denmark, and not by engineers, but actually by farmers. And they start by handcraft to produce wind turbines. This was, was the first one, producing electricity at a bigger scale in Denmark. It was the Jules uh, wind turbine, 200 kilowatts, in the late uh, 1950s. Yeah? And here is when they start discovering like three blades is the best design. They start uh, making bigger and bigger machines. Many of them failed, many of them broke, but they learned from these failures. And they now, as, 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 as country, let's say, became the leaders, the pioneers in this, they established this company called Vestas, which continued to be one of the leaders in this technology. And now they have these huge wind turbines that we see also here in, in, in Germany and all other countries. And everything started with a, gr a group of small farmers in Denmark trying to be independent of other sources of energy. Yeah? So we can also follow this path. So not so much R&D, more learning. But anyway, this case also took around 50 to 60 years. And there are other ways to learn, like just using this so consumers provide also feedback or inter interacting. So you make these two guys, the researchers and the uh, handcrafter, to speak to each other. Now, if we look into the R&D picture, so how much are our countries investing in R&D for renewables at the moment? At the moment, we are investing, the estimates say that we are investing around uh, 9 billion US dollars per year in renewables. It sounds like a big amount of money, but actually it's peanuts. It's less than 3% of what we invest in renewable energy deployment. So I was mentioning that we are investing per year around 250, 300 billion per year. So actually this is only like 3% of that. Yeah? Way below what, for example, we spend in armament, weapons, uh, well, another other uh, industrial, automobile, etc. 
Yeah? And even more concerning than that, sorry, is that actually this was growing between the 2000 and 2010, but now it's kind of flat. So we are actually not increasing this spend in R&D for renewables. So we need to do better, definitely, in this area. But now the good news is that if we look at inventions reflected, for example, in patents for renewables, actually, apparently, this small amount of money we are investing in R&D is very efficiently used, because we are seeing a very stable and significant growth of patents in renewables. Actually, we have at the moment, historically, more than 600,000 patents in renewables, and they are growing uh, at a rate of 70% per year. This is much higher than, again, automobile sector, steel sector. So we are investing less, but actually we are getting much more inventions in renewables than in other industry sectors. Most of it is coming from wind, solar, PV. But the other interesting uh, part here is that all of the uh, renewable energy technologies, including also bioenergy and so on, have, in the last 10 years, have tripled. So if we compare how many inventions we have today as 10 years ago for any of the renewables, we have at least three times more than uh, 10 years ago. And also the good news is that we see that there is a correlation between patent or inventions and actual deployment. So how this technology will be deployed in the future. And what we also, and this is also not only for renewables, in other sectors we see the same. Actually, the slope of the curves, this is the, the dark one is uh, the number of patents filed, and this one is the number of, of, of wind turbines or whatever deployed, actually file, follow a very similar pattern, but with, uh, of course, a bit uh, of delay no? between the two of them. So what we can see is that if we see a very uh, encouraging uh, growth of patents in the renewable energy field, we may all suspect a, a similar uh, rate of deployment in renewables in the next 10 years. The other interesting thing we are seeing is that actually to have more renewables in the system, you need to innovate not only in renewable energy technologies, so not only wind turbines, wind farms, but actually we need to innovate more in enabling technologies. So technologies which are not renewable technologies, but are technologies that will make these renewables to be part of our energy system. What is that? For example, batteries. Batteries is not a renewable energy technology, but through batteries you can store renewable power that you can use later. Electric vehicles. Electric vehicles is not a renewable energy technology, but electric vehicles can run through renewable power and also use this renewable power to integrate more renewables in the transport sector. Yeah? So this is what we call enabling technologies for renewables. And what we are seeing is that actually more innovation is now and faster innovation is coming from these enabling technologies than actually from renewable technologies. So in the case of PV again, we are seeing that anyway remarkable in the last 10 years, uh, inventions have grown more than six uh, times. But if we compare that, for example, with electric vehicles charging now, the inventions for this field is, is, is incredible. It has grown in the last 10 years more than 16 times. Yeah? And these inventions here actually will make that these other inventions will integrate better, let's say, in energy systems. Now, in energy technologies, let's say, one of these, among the different technologies we have, which is still in a very early stage, is ocean. So we in PV, we discussed they are actually quite advanced at the moment, but ocean are still kind of a very early stage. So I wanted to show that actually we have actually many inventions around ocean technology, how to use energy from the waves. We have these floating things that can uh, go up and down and, and use this energy. We have uh, these turbines that when the waves go up and down, also create uh, movement and, and run a turbine that creates electricity. And we have things that look like a snake and with the movement produce electricity. Or this that looks like an inverted pendulum that also produce electricity from waves. Yeah? So we have many inventions, but actually they are not picking up yet. They are still very costly, so uh, and we will see that a uh, later, but uh, they are still very costly. And one of the issues about innovation is that at certain point, you really need some convergence in technology. If you have in a field many technologies competing, it's very difficult that they will scale up because 
people will not know, okay, should we go for this technology or this technology or this one? So which one is the one that we should follow? And then you will not have this scale that you need to actually grow. So at certain point, you will need some convergence towards a design. And actually what we are seeing now at the moment is that this point of absorber seems to be that the technology that is running now ahead. But we need this kind of uh, decisions soon. Now, the cost of, 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 of uh, ocean, for example, is between 300 and 600 euros per megawatt hour, is what it says here. So just to compare that with the other technologies which are more mature. So in comparison, for example, with PV, when it was very costly uh, in 2010, ocean is actually maybe somewhere here. Yeah? So that's the role of innovation also. We need to bring the cost of ocean from here to maybe here, hopefully maybe here one day. But we need definitely in this area very soon. Now let's look at the later stages of innovation. So the market formation. Okay, now we research, we develop, we demonstrate this technology is ready to be commercialized. Great, no? But now how we, can we make this technology which is working perfectly in a pilot actually mass scale deployment. So it's used in every country, megawatts installed, and so on. Well, first, we need to pay for what is called the learning. And learning is very expensive. Well, in Germany, it's not so expensive because universities are for free. But in other countries, learning is very expensive. But we are not talking here about education. It's a different type of learning. Learning here is what we, this theory of the learning curve is basically how after you have a technology which is already demonstrated because of economies of scale, you reduce dramatically the cost of this technology and make it competitive with other conventional technologies. So PV was demonstrated, it worked perfectly in the 1980s, but too costly. So innovation was not more really needed in making this uh, module more efficient and so on, so it helps. But now what we really need is to make it cheaper. And to make it cheaper, what we need is not to produce 10 PV modules per day. We need to produce 1 million PV modules per day. And then we can bring the cost down really to the scale that we need. And this is the learning curve. And the theory says that uh, there is a correlation between the deployment, so how many PV modules I'll produce, and the cost of these modules. And what we have seen in, is in the case of PV, for example, every time that we double the installed capacity, global installed capacity of PV, of PV, we see that the cost of PV is reduced in 22%. Yeah? So this is the line here. So if you see, for example, between uh, uh, 92 and 2002, we went from 10, uh, sorry, 100 megawatts to 1,000 megawatts of installed capacity of PV, so 10 times, yeah? And it reduced the cost uh, from, yeah, maybe 10,000 10, US dollars to 1,000 US dollars, yeah? But then, in the next few years, so in just between 2002 and 2008, more or less, we grow from 1,000 megawatts to 10,000 megawatts, yeah? So another 10 times, yeah? And in this, and growth of 10 times, we actually reduce much, like t 10 times more, what we had in 2000, uh, sorry, in, in 1996. So, because this is a logarithmic uh, scale. So basically what I'm trying to say here is that economies of scale are the key to reduce cost. And this is what we call the learning curve. Now the, the big question is, who pays for that, no? So who is going to create a market that can make this technology deploy massively? Well, I will tell you a secret. So in the case of PV, to a certain extent, it was Germany. Because in the uh, late 90s, beginning of 2000s, they came up with this very innova in innovation in policy, which is called the feed-in tariff. And because of that, now we have, or in Germany, we saw a tremendous growth of PV in just a period of six years. And because of that, then the producers of, of PV modules in Germany could go from producing maybe, I don't know, as I said, 100 modules per day to actually 1,000 modules per day and then 10,000 modules per day. And that reduced the cost to the levels that we saw. And then China took it from here. And they said, thank you, Germany. That was very nice. Now let's go to China and we don't produce now 10,000. Now we produce 
maybe one million modules per day. And then we are here. No? So this economy of scale and learning process is extremely important, but the question is who is going to pay for that? No? And there has to be a common agreement on how we are going to cover that. Now, scaling up is also important to have harmonized markets. Yeah? So I need that something that is produced in Germany can also be used in China, can be, produced in, uh, can be used in Brazil, can be used in India, in Africa. Yeah? So we need to harmonize the requirements for this technology in all the countries. And in this sense, standards are very important. These technical standards are extremely important in harmonizing that. And let's move away from the energy sector to give you an example on why harmonization is important. In 2003, two, two cities between Germany and Switzerland decided to, bridge, to build a bridge to cross from Germany to Switzerland in, in uh, Laufenburg. And they say, let's do it very cooperative, very nicely. So you Germans, you build half of the bridge. We Swiss, we build the other half of the bridge. We meet in the middle and we celebrate. You -hoo. say, wow, this is a really cool plan. Let's do it. OK. They start building up. And they were just a few meters from each other, you know, already with the beer, sausages, everything. And then, oops, why your part is 44 centimeters higher than my part? <laughs> OK, what, what's happening here? And they say, oh, of course, the Germans say, it's not my fault, we are Germans, we never make mistakes, so it's you Swiss. What did you do? Say, what? what the heck? And so what, 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 what happened? And actually, what happened is that they were saying that, okay, our bridge will be five meters, you know, the, the lower part, five meters above the sea level. Yeah? And actually, the Germans, the standard for the a sea level measure was the North Sea. And for the Swiss, it was the Mediterranean Sea. And actually, the North Sea is 52 centimeters higher than the Mediterranean Sea. So that's why they had this mistake. And it costed a lot of money and effort to actually, let's say, correct this error. Yeah? So they didn't use the same standard for building this bridge and they had this, this mistake. And this, does, of course, doesn't happen only in, in, in civil engineering. In all things, if you come with a very cool technology, but actually the requirement in the country where you want to sell this is different, you come with, a, for example, a, a new, I don't know, microwave or coffee machine from Europe to, to Colombia, and actually we have a different voltage. Yeah, very cool. It costed me 2,000 euros, and I cannot use it. Great. No? So standardization is extremely important if we want to scale up technologies. And also, of course, these technologies are risky because they are new, so we need to mitigate this risk. And for that, we need, really need to ensure the quality of this. And quality control is extremely important, and for that, you need really strong uh, standards. So a couple of examples of technologies that are reaching commercialization at the moment in renewable energy is one is this advanced liquid biofuels. Advanced liquid biofuels are basically biofuels but produced from uh, a feedstock which does not compete with food. So basically it's not from sugar cane or maize or corn, you know, it's for other source. Basically wood or residues, yeah? and there are new uh, ways to uh, produce these uh, advanced biofuels and it's, it's, let's say, now what is used, for example, for the aviation sector and so on. But this is not yet commercially available. It's just pilots and demonstration, but it's reaching commercialization very, very quickly. And actually, good news was that two years ago, the biggest plant of uh, advanced liquid biofuels of producing ethanol, so alcohol, from uh, uh, residues of, of corn, so basically the, the husk and the, the leaves and so on, was constructed and started operating in the US. 150 million liters of, of bioethanol per year, to the October 2015. Great celebration two years ago, October 2015. I read the news October 2017, two months ago. This company announced they are bankrupt. Why? Because they didn't have the business model to run this plant. They couldn't make money out of it. So innovation is not only technology. Innovation is business models. Innovation is regulation. You cannot introduce a technology just with a very cool, efficient technology. You need the business model behind it. Hmm? 
The other example, hopefully this is more positive, offshore wind. Now we have wind turbines, but people don't like to see it in the beautiful uh, countryside of Germany, in Bavaria. Yeah? Because it's, it's beautiful, the landscape is really beautiful. So you don't want to go and see Neue Weinstein, no, the castle, and have a wind turbine in front of you you know, that covers the, the view from there. So people were thinking, okay, what can we do? Okay, let's put those on, on sea, so no one can see it, and produce electricity from there. And it's working now. And actually, we produce a report on that, which is, okay, we don't have more copies there, but some of you have copies on how this technology we developed. It's from last year. And actually, we thought, look, this is really promising. We will have this technology commercially available maybe in 2020, and we have a tremendous cost reduction. So in 2015, the cost was around 170 US dollars per megawatt. In 2030, maybe we will see 95. So in 15 years, we will see a cost of electricity of 95 US dollars per megawatt. Well, very nice. I read the news again, October 2017, actually, the current price of offshore wind of the latest uh, project that have auctioned here in, in Germany, but also in Denmark and other countries, is below 70 US dollars per megawatt hour. So what we expected to see maybe in 15 years from, from now, from 2015, happened in two years. And we are seeing now gigawatts installed, but more than that. So the turbines that we see now on sea are all with towers that are fixed to the seabed. No? So they, they are very long and then they are uh, attached to the seabed. But of course, if you go into really deep waters, you cannot so have such long towers to, to reach the seabed. So now the next step is that, okay, we need these turbines actually floating. Yeah? And we thought, yeah, this technology is very interesting. We have pilots and maybe it will come in 2025. Well, October 2017, the first floating wind farm start operating in Scotland. Six of these wind turbines, actually manufactured by an oil company, Stat Oil, now operating and producing electricity in the UK. So more than 80,000 homes in the UK are powered by six turbines which are floating in the ocean in Scotland. So yeah, it's, innovation is very difficult to predict. Sometimes you think the things will happen great. You see, okay, these guys are bankrupt. Sometimes you think, oh, this will happen in 20 years. Happens in two years. So uncertainty is, is very high. And it's not only, this is how we expect that continuous cost reduction of wind turbines offshore. We thought, okay, most of the cost reduction will come from turbines, so innovation in turbines, bigger turbines. As, so in the case of uh, wind turbines, it is through this saying that the size matters. In this case, the size matters. Because the biggest the turbine is, the biggest the what is called the capacity factor of the turbine is. So you can actually use more efficiently each one of the turbines. So if you have bigger turbines, then it's, you can reduce the cost of this uh, energy. The problem is the materials. So how you can have a material which is light and so withstand the weight of a blade, which is maybe 100, 2 meters, uh, 200 meters long. Yeah? But now the developments are going in that direction, and now we have these huge wind turbines, and we will see more and more uh, bigger wind turbines. So this will be a big part of this uh, uh, cost reduction. But the other part is, will come from others. And what is these others? These others is logistics. So better ways and cheaper ways to actually transport and install these wind turbines in the sea. A cheaper cost of finance for these uh, uh, projects. So these innovations, which are non-technology innovations, will be a big part of these cost reductions. Okay, that was the first part of our presentation. So now I hand it over to my colleague, Arina. So she, she will say a few more words about now the power sector. Hello, thank you Francisco. Um, well, my name is Arina and I uh, work with Francisco in the innovation team on renewable energy innovation in Irina. And uh, 
I will continue Francisco's presentation. It was very interesting, no? <laughs> I myself learned a lot of things that we didn't <laughs> discuss in the office. <laughs> um, I, will, uh, I will present you a little bit, try to, to make you understand what is the power sector transformation and to show you some of the innovations that are emerging now in the power sector that are already on the market in the commercializ commercialization phase, but very incipient. Uh, I think I will start with a video. This video, it was, um, uh, it's from our assembly, that it's a big event organized every year in January, where that gathers the, all the member states and also private sector and discuss uh, uh, topics uh, and uh, the direction of the, uh, our agency. But this video in particular, it's about innovation and it, you see some of the discussions and the topics that were on the table uh, in the last assembly, and it's interesting to see how both power, uh, private sector and public sector come together and, uh, and fight for this, uh, try to move forward, accelerate the, the energy transition. So, I will You really get a sense when you're working on renewable energy that this is a moment of opportunity. So, the alignment of all the different trends have come together in this moment. So, we have, for instance, the cost declines in technology. We have the infrastructure development uh, that has allowed the uh, uh, integration of variable renewables into the system in safe and manageable ways. We have uh, a decarbonization imperative that we have to deal with and we have an invest investment model where we have to grow our economy and create employment. Renewable energy presents a golden opportunity in all of that because it ticks every box. We have reached a point now where the renewables are the strongest source in our power system. So we have to do several things. The first one is move the renewables to the market. Very important. Those who produce electricity have to take on the responsibility for marketing the, uh, the electricity and we have to introduce more competition. So in Germany we moved away from the feed-in tariffs which were very helpful at the beginning now to auction existing. Then the second biggest issue is making the market ready for renewables. We need more flexibility. So the innovation currently, besides the technical innovation, is mainly a market and a legislation innovation on this market side to follow up uh, with the speed of the integration of renewables. And actually, we reached last year already 49%. So 49% of the consumption in one third of Germany are covered by intermittent renewable energy. And that was only possible because we made um, changes in the market design. Innovation in business models. What we can learn from Silicon Valley is that a tiny company can become a $600 billion company in less than a generation. But the good news is that it's not just business models, it's changing people's lives. Uh, innovation is coming from the manufacturing industry, by and large. They are, they, they are innovating continuously, their products. It's the whole industry innovating in all its manufacturing base. We can see already now new potential of market for renewables. This is particularly true if you are considering two sectors, the digital market and transport, in particular, electromobility. Uh, what surprised me out of the debate, by the way, was uh, the private sector saying there's no shortage of investment sitting on the sidelines looking for a new home in the renewable sector. So what does that say to governments? Uh, it's about the regulatory framework that needs to be established to give the investor comfort to go in uh, not only to the developed world when it comes to renewable energy, but also go into the developing world. It's not about financing. Uh, there's a lot of money, surprisingly a lot of money out there willing to invest into this. So we need more projects. That's what we need. Uh, there's huge competition for every project out there. Uh, so if there were more projects, we would have seen faster uh, development. Well, the, the, uh, the progress we have seen in the last five years is really amazing. The costs uh, have come down uh, dramatically and the field of applications has really broadened. But what you see now is that uh, renewables innovation is really changing here.
Okay. Nice, no? <laughs> you like? Good. Um, to move on here, it's a slide that shows you a little bit uh, how fast uh, the renewable energy was deployed in Germany. We can see that in 2000 there were very few power, power renewable plants, like the red dots there that are the wind uh, uh, generators. Already in 2006, when the wind technology uh, was more developed and the cost decreased, the north of Germany was uh, full of, uh, of uh, wind turbines. And then, as uh, Francisco said, with the finite tariffs and the innovation in the policy that was brought in Germany, uh, a lot of solar was deployed in, in eight years, until 2014, as the graph show in the south of Germany. However, now it's even more, but uh, the graph is not updated. Uh, but what does this mean for the power sector? Um, all the, because we are building and building more renewables, but I would like to explain you a little bit how it, inf uh, it impacts these uh, renewables in the power sector, because this is a, a generation that is variable. We cannot control. The wind is blowing, and then we have uh, wind energy, and the solar is shining, and then we can have produce solar, but we cannot uh, control it to, as, a, we co as we can control a power plant uh, from coal or from gas that we start it and stop it whenever we, we want. So there are some challenges that this, uh, this generation pose to the power system. And this is how the power system traditionally looked. It, uh, it starts, f uh, if there we have the big generator plants, uh, coal, uh, gas, uh, whatever you want. Then it, uh, it goes, the electricity generated, it goes into the transmission and it transported through the uh, high voltage on the large uh, distances. Then when it goes closer to the consumer, it gets into power distribution uh, uh, network, which is lower voltage. And then it goes into consumer house and uh, into like industry and uh, household. But now with variable, uh, with renewables, there the, it appears uh, we have wind turbines that are mm, mostly uh, uh, away from the consumer, so there, the energy produced by the wind that has to go through uh, transmission and distribution, it's a bit farther than the, from the load. And we also have uh, solar, that it's closer to the load, it's on the roof of the consumer, or uh, if it's large solar, it's uh, connected to the distribution, because it's closer to the load. And all this uh, uh, generation is variable, and also because we produce, we start producing in the consumer's house, then the flow also goes in the other direction. It's not only from the generation to the consumer, but now the consumer starts injecting into the grid, and it, it goes into the distribution, and maybe possibly in the transmission to be transported to another consumer's. So these are changes that are happening due to the so much deployment of uh, variable renewable energy. And it impacts the system, and uh, it changes the business as usual case. And they, we need more innovation in uh, how to operate the system, more innovation in how to, to regulate the system in order to allow these uh, changes to, to be accommodated and to make uh, room for more renewables to be deployed. Um, yes. So as I uh, said, the renewable technologies, mostly we have them there. They are cost uh, efficient, solar and wind. Uh, we can deploy as much as we want. The question is now how to integrate all this in, the, in our system. And for that, we have innovations in, it's a, in all the system. We have enabling infrastructure innovation, which means that we have to innovate in other technologies that enable uh, the system to accommodate more renewables. And what does that mean? It means, firstly, mostly storage. Um, with the storage, it comes also electric vehicles, which has batteries inside, uh, digitalization, blockchain. Here, I will present very fast a big picture, but then we, can, we will go with, uh, in some of them in more detail. So besides all this technological uh, advancement that we're doing in, to accommodate more renewables, we also need new business models in order to create uh, some uh, revenue stream for these technologies to, to make a business and to, to be able to um, yeah, survive on the, on the market. Um, and I will also explain later these a few of the business models. Then we also need new market regulations and new rules for the generators to, to participate in the market and for the distributed generation that are now a new participant. 
uh, and the system is uh, migrating for a completely centralized one where the, the generation was large generation in one side and it was one flow to all the consumers to decentralized system where everybody can produce at small scale and then everybody is trading with everybody and it creates a different uh, setting for the entire system. And also the regulation should make rules to encourage flexibility, which is now very important for the system as the renewables from, from wind and solar is very variable. The system needs to be more flexible in order to adjust to when the sun is, is shining and the wind is blowing. And we need, besides uh, rules, we also need new ways to operate the system in, in, in a more efficient way and to take advantage of the complementarities in the renewables. Uh, the solar shines mostly in the day, the, the wind is stronger in the night, also we have hydro resources and it ha it's a very strong correlation between uh, the rain season uh, no, when it's uh, rainy, it's not so windy, but when it's not rainy, it's more windy, so there should, they can, we can create many complementarities bet between all these renewables resources. And also the spatial, inter spatial interconnection. In, in north of Germany, we have uh, a lot of wind, in south we have solar, but uh, then we need interconnections and very strong networks in order to transport in the, during the night, the evening, the, the the electricity produced in the north from wind to the south and the other way around in, during the day when, when uh, the solar is shining and electricity is produced in the south. And also one of the solutions, uh, a very, uh, possible solution for uh, decarbonizing other sectors, not uh, only power sector, it's electrification of the other sector. And in transport there are electric vehicles, uh, water heat pumps in the heating sector and like to use electricity for all the other sectors instead of other fuels. Um, well, this uh, was an overview of some of the innovations that are happening in the, in the power sector. Now I would like to, to focus a little bit on one very important one, uh, technology innovation, battery storage. And uh, the battery storage is quite a game changer in the whole industry. Um, because it changed the nature a little bit of the electricity. What was uh, very particular about electricity, the dif the, one of the biggest difference of electricity and any other commodity, like uh, I know, coffee, sugar, is that uh, electricity could not be stored. You have to consume it, uh, you have to, better, you have to produce it in the moment that you want to consume it. When you turn on the light uh, in the house, there is a generator who should start generating electricity. So it was uh, everything almost real time. But now, with this uh, storage appliances that uh, we are developing, uh, this is a little bit changing. Of course, it will not get to the level of coffee or sugar that we can buy <laughs> and store it in very hu huge amounts. But still, we can store a little bit, uh, a bit electricity when the sun is shining and we don't need that sun and uh, use it later. And this is very useful for uh, bringing flexibility in the system and for allowing to uh, accommodate more renewables. Um, yeah, this is uh, two big uh, types of uh, storage. Tech we are talking mostly about battery storage here and uh, these are two big types of, uh, of technologies. One is the large scale technology, the uh, batteries that are connected mainly to, to the distribution grids or to transmission possibly. And um, uh, what is the advantage of this uh, is, as I said, uh, instead of, uh, in Germany it happens a lot that in the north there is a lot of wind that we don't need it and the demand is not there when the wind is blowing, so it's curtailed. That means that it's just not used, it's wasted. So with the storage we can uh, store this uh, energy that it's for free basically because the wind is blowing and it's there. We can store it and use it later when the, we need it, when the demand is uh, it's higher. Um, also, we can do energy arbitrage, which is a little bit like that, to, to store electricity when it's very cheap and to sell it when it's more expensive. And um, um, another advantage that we can uh, uh, bring to the system with the, with the storage is, for example, to build a storage appliances next to the wind farm. And this will uh, 
will bring will give more flexibility to the wind and will give it a more give this wind plant a better position in the market to uh, sell and buy the and the electricity whenever it's uh, it's needed. Everything is related. The all these uh, three actually. It's more that some of them it's from a business model point of view and the other one for yeah. And uh, also we have uh, small scale storage. That means that are small appliances that people can install in their home and uh, take advantage of the synergies uh, with the wind solar that they might have on the roof. And when the wind, uh, the wind solar, the solar panel, the, when it's producing, uh, most uh, normally the people are the pers the people are at, are at work, and uh, then the storage appliances can store this uh, solar uh, energy and uh, use it later in the evening when the electricity is higher and the uh, electricity price is higher and there is no uh, solar anymore. And uh, also, um, small scale storage are, uh, appliances are also very used in these uh, remote areas where you, have, uh, you don't have a proper system, it's, there are mini grids. And now the solar systems are, you need a backup, you cannot have a system, a mini grid system only with solar because it's very unreliable, it doesn't produce you cannot have electricity when you need it. So now the, back, the main backup is diesel uh, uh, plants based on oil. But with the batteries, uh, we can uh, avoid diesel and, and uh, store the electricity from solar and make uh, yeah, a sure 100% uh, uh, reliance, reliability. Um, however, the technology is uh, very incipient. It's, uh, we have on the market many storage appliances, but uh, it's, uh, the costs are, are still high, so uh, we need more market to pull to decrease the cost of the technology. Also, uh, the industry is not so familiar, familiarized with uh, this technology, so uh, there need uh, to increase familiarity between uh, utilities, regulators, uh, how to finance this technology to, to uh, build capacity in order to maintain and to operate this, uh, this uh, storage. And also, uh, you, we need new rules for the market to, to regulate the wholesale market, the uh, retail market, to accommodate and to make revenue streams uh, to remunerate this uh, technology for all the services that it can provide. Okay. Uh, now, I will go through another innovation that is happening and it's related to electricity storage, but we will talk more about this uh, storage and the batteries in the electric vehicles. And uh, probably we've heard, you have heard a lot talking about electric vehicles, or I don't know, but there are all over in the news, many countries are putting uh, targets, are uh, making uh, incentives, uh, because the potential is very high. Uh, one study is from IRENA, uh, said that uh, in 2030, 10% of the total passenger car fleet will be electric, will be from electric vehicles, uh, which is a lot. <laughs> then, uh, but electric vehicles, uh, yeah, it doesn't mean only electric cars. We we also have uh, electric bikes that uh, could uh, reach a very high number in 2030, 90 millions from today, 200 million, and this is will be mostly used in very crowded city where the traffic is uh, it's, uh, impossible. And also for public transportation, uh, we have a great potential in electric buses, and mostly China is pushing a lot for this uh, technology now because to, to they, they have high incentives to the, uh, clean up the cities for, of the pollution. Oh no, okay. Um, uh, electric vehicles are actually at uh, the border between the power sector and the transportation sector. And through electric vehicles, we have the potential, the opportunity to decarbonize both sectors. But we have to do it very smartly. Because if we charge the electric vehicles from electricity that is not clean, that means that we actually don't decarbonize any of the sectors. We produce mere electricity and the transport uses electricity that is not clean. So the whole idea of uh, decarbonizing the transport sector, it's using uh, 
electricity from renewables to charge the batteries. In the same time, batteries are uh, basically seen by the power sector, should be seen as not as a load per se, but as a, a battery, as a storage appliances. And it can use this to provide more flexibility from the, like to use the car to provide flexibility to the system and to incorporate even more renewables as uh, I explained before, the, the case of storage, sm small scale storage, basically. Um, so, um, another thing that uh, we have to, to uh, educate the consumer when they buy an electric car, it's to, char to, and to, to build uh, like a system in place, it's, it's uh, to, smart the car char uh, to, to charge the car smartly. Because if we plug it and we want it to be charged in uh, 10 minutes at whatever day of the time, that will just add some load on the power sector, but will not facilitate in any way and not bring any, any uh, flexibility or advantage to the system. So it's very important. Load management, which means um, basically to, to charge the car when there is renewable energy available in the system, when there is solar or there, there is wind. And of course, we cannot, uh, we have to have the liberty to use the car whenever we want, not necessarily when there is solar <laughs> and otherwise we cannot use it. But the charging should be made in an optimal way for the power sector. For example, you want to charge the car and you have an application and you can put in the application that I need the car in five hours and I want to drive this many kilometers and then there will be an optimization with the, power, with the, power, with the system, the power system, and your car will be charged for your needs but will be charged as it uh, accommodates and fits better the system, the power sector. The power sector, yeah. Um, so for this, we need to create awareness between the consumer and to make them aware that the, this should be maybe remunerating them in some way or yeah, to, to make them aware of this impact that they can have. Also, on the next level, we can also use the, the electricity that is stored in the car batteries back to the grid when the grid needs it. And this is V2G technology, vehicle to grid, that the, electric, the, ba the battery from the vehicle, it's also injecting electricity into the grid. And it, it gets remunerated for that, and you can make uh, extra money as a consumer. Um, here, it's a list of a few of the countries that are very active in this, uh, uh, in uh, incentivizing more uh, electric vehicles. and. Uh, I will not go through all of this, but I just wanted to point out that uh, to, to uh, deploy more electric vehicles and to start uh, this electric vehicle market in the country, most of the countries adopted targets, very clear targets that they put by uh, US and uh, France. Uh, they banned uh, the sale of, LA, of uh, normal gas cars, petrol cars by uh, 2020 or 2030. And only electric vehicles, uh, cars will be available for sale, and yeah, different targets that the country puts. Then, uh, electric vehicles are still expensive because the battery is still expensive, so the price of an electric vehicle is almost double or more, I think, than the price of a normal vehicle, so we need purchase incentives so that the, the customers have some, uh, either some price benefit or some other benefits, uh, if not monetary, some other benefits, like such as they are allowed to park uh, for free in the parking, or they are allowed to charge electricity for free in the car, or they are allowed to, to drive to some lines that usually only public transportation is allowed to. There are different incentives that, that you can give at this point. And also, the charging infrastructure is very, it's an important factor because you have to have charging points all over the city, so to create, to uh, for the electric vehicles to be able to be charged whenever needed. So this is very expensive and there is no uh, business model that is yet in place for that, for the private sector to use it. So it's very important here to have the support of the government and the support of the cities to implement and to deploy these charging points in, in, the, in the city. Good. One more innovation I have. <laughs> and this is uh, the new role of the consumers. And now, as, we, as you have seen, 
we start having more and more an active role in, the, in this uh, power sector. We are building uh, the generate, generating plants in our home. We have a solar panel on, on the rooftop. We can install also the batteries in the house. We can also have an electric vehicle that is plugged directly in the, in the plug in our home that can also serve as a small battery for us to be charged directly uh, from our PV panel. We have smart meters that control and shows in real time uh, what is the consumption, how much we uh, consume from, from the grid, how much we give back to the grid, inject, so to keep a balance. And, uh, and uh, digitalization is more and more emerging. And what means digitalization means that more, most of the appliances in the house, they could be smart meaning that they can communicate between them and between the uh, storage and the, distributed, and the PV solar and it can be with an optimization system to decide when the washing machine uh, should start washing or when the, I don't know, the heating should start heating up according to, to the temperature in-house, the temperature out, outside, the future production of the solar. There are many uh, optimization and digitalization that uh, could happen in the in in this uh, in the house and artificial intelligence, wh which would allow us not to be not to have to control all the objects in the house via an application, but to control them by themselves, to make them intelligent by themselves, and to learn our behavior patterns and to react to that by themselves. And uh, this is uh, how a smart house would be, that I, I just explained with all the, all, uh, all these uh, smart devices and the electric vehicle and the solar, and now it, appe it appeared actually some utilities are also selling some devices that you connect through smart plugs, all this, uh, and you can control from the office or something how, what is the temperature that you want to have in the house, and now I want the fridge to stop or to start or whatever. Um, and now I will tell a little bit about the business models that appeared around this, um, these uh, technologies and especially for the consumer. And one of them is renewable energy aggregator, also called virtual power plant, which means that we don't need anymore a big plant to, to a central big plant to supply us with energy, but we have uh, distributed generation in all, all the roofs, and of course we have extra, extra electricity that we generate and we don't need. And that one we injected to the grid. Um, but what virtual power plant does is that it collects and it aggregates all this small uh, generation, also uh, storage, not only generation plants, but also all these technologies, and it acts like a big plant for in the market and it can bid and it can sell electricity and buy electricity from the market in the wholesale market as it would be a big plant and this is more uh, it brings more remuneration to the customer than just injecting the grid at the grid fair um, another very trend business models that we see it's a tra peer to peer trading which basically means that i produce this electricity it's mine and I wanted to sell it to my neighbor. I want to do whatever I want with that and to sell it to whoever I, whoever I want and people start trading between them. And there is actually an application that is, uh, was launched in Netherlands. It's called Power Peers. That it, it works exactly like an Uber for electricity. You have a platform, you enter there and you choose from which neighbor you want to buy the electricity and he puts the price. And then if you sell, you, you put a price on your electricity that you sell it to your neighbors. It's something that is growing a lot, and people start buying and trading between, uh, between them uh, the electricity and not in, uh, with a retailer. Good. I think this was all the innovations that I wanted to present you today. It's a very excited sector. There are many things happening. I hope you are also excited. <laughs> and um, I will hand on to my, to my um, colleague, Alexandra, to tell you about Inspire.
Thank you, Arina. I'm Alessandra. I'm also part of the innovation team in the International Renewable Energy Agency. So in the agency, we came up with a very big question. So it was like how we can actually measure or track innovation. And then since some years ago, we have been looking how to solve this question. So then uh, if you go into bibliography or you read a little how to track innovation, there's different indicators. But there's no like a one or an ideal one to track innovation. So then you can go to startups or you can go to think tanks, see what they're doing, what they're, they're, they're having by initiatives. You can also look at the R&D investments, see what, how many budget we're putting in this, and then this could be part of an indicator as well. You can look into intellectual property, so patents, or maybe other, yeah, mark trade. Venture capital, funding for new ideas. R&D initiatives, so how many projects you have, innovative projects you have in the pipeline. So in ARENA, we have looked in all of these. Um, some of you have already picked some of uh, our reports. And Francisco already explained some about R&D investments, also <clears throat> different innovation projects that I, Arina just shared with you. But then we have some, since uh, already three years and a half ago, we have gone into patents activities. So we have went more deeper into what is patent activity analysis. And this is what is inspired about. So what I'm going to do is that I have a short demonstration about how you can actually search for the latest trends in renewable energy. And as well, I will take the opportunity to, because Inspire shows you data about patents, but at the same time, you can find information about standards. And Francisco also, he mentioned this, how, how standards are important. Standards, they tell us how to do things in the best way, or the best practices you can do something. So in this way, you can, use, you can use the standards to innovate, you can use the standards to operate your technology, or you can even use the standards to decommission your technology. So I'll show you, we have a small demonstration, a video, on how you can look for this data. Okay, here we go. So this is the Inspire platform, and this is the landing page. As I was saying, w one of our platforms in Irina, when you go, there is a model about patents. And in here, you can find all information about patent activity in renewable energy. So we did here a small example about what is uh, ocean energy. So what is that technological development happening in ocean energy? Once you fill by ocean energy, you can also fill by subcomponents. In this case, there is no sub-technology. Sub if it was solar, you will have solar photovoltaic or solar thermal, solar hybrid. And then on the graph in the right, you will see which countries are front runners for ocean energy. So in here you will notice, well, you can also filter by time frame. So in there we did it by five years. And then you can see on the, on the left-hand graph, for example, China, United States, Korea, South Korea, Japan. These are countries that right now they're working in technological developments for ocean energy. Then in the bottom, we have a list of top 10 organizations. So this is quite interesting. You can see universities, which universities, which research institutes also have a prominent role in developing new technologies. So this could serve as a good benchmark. Or also, if you're working in one technology, you can reach out to these organizations. And then we have technology components. So it goes into the type of technology. So you could look for patents. In this case, you have oscillating water column. You have um, also wave energy or energy created by tides. So this is, you can find for information for all the different renewable energy technologies, bioenergy, hydropower, solar photovoltaics. We have other data sets. So before you saw one graph, that this one shows the evolution of patents. So it can go by cumulative or net additions. You can filter by a country to see how a country has evolved in patents. Or either you can also filter by a sub-technology, so solar photovoltaics, as I was saying. In here, we did an example with um, solar energy. 
to see what has happened in uh, innovative uh, ideas and technology developments the last years. And you can see how the growth has been significant for solar energy. Since 10 years ago, from 30,000 patents to over 300,000, I think, or yeah, similar. And then we have other data sets that uh, are on the top that we have developed. And all of this data, you can use it for your studies, your analysis, or if you're working with renewable energy. So this is regarding enabling technologies. This was explained before by Arena. Enabling technologies, we talk about electromobility, we talk about storage, about fuel cells. So as well, then you can go here and see what has been the patent activities the last 16 years. We did hear an example about uh, electromobility, so in the transport sector. And see as well how these enabling technologies are also being really, really active, how more inventions are being patented in what is um, electrical vehicle charging. So once you filter, then you can have the data of the patents that have been filed during the last years. So for even Francisco mentioned, this, this sector has uh, experienced a growth of over 16 times in the last 10 years. And to walk you through the other data sets we have in Inspire, going also up, we have uh, one that gives you more of a global vision. So what is happening in an overall context for a renewable energy technology? In this case, we went uh, for solar energy too. And then the darker countries are the ones that have filed the most quantity of patents. But at the same time, you can see which others are starting to innovate and to, de to develop more technologies. And finally, in this patent section, we also have one that goes into a more detail that is a country analysis. So once you click, you can, uh, it's an interactive map. You can click on a country and see what has happened in all the technologies, so how they have developed technologies the latest years. Um, in Inspire, we have a section that is about networking, and then you can find all the patent offices that are around the world. So how this could be useful, for example, if you have an idea or if you're entrepreneuring, this is not just about renewable energy. It's, it will show you the patent office that is in each country. In this case, we clicked on Russia, but you could click Germany, Netherlands, whichever. It will tell you the intellectual property office that you could reach out and actually learn how you could patent, how you could file the patent, what is the process, how to reach out to them. And uh, I'll show you the part about standards. So we did also, we have this section about the standards. And it's the same concept. You can filter by renewable energy technology. So in the first, in this dough graph, you can see the different share by renewable energy technology, so standards in hydropower, solar. And you can also see standards in different areas. So testing, performance, sustainability, installation. And in the last part, you can see who are making these standards. So there are different organizations that act actually develop these standards. And the example we did here is that we wanted to show that besides renewable energy, there's standards in other sectors. So we've, if you go into the general cat category there, what we wanted to show is that these enabling technologies that will in give more renewable energy into the electricity matrix or the heating matrix as well, they're starting to create more standards. So you can find a standards in rural electrification, in information technologies, in certification. In there, then on the right, you'll see which standard it is. So in this one, it's for um, electromobility. And then you can click on it. It will take you to where is the standard, how you can actually in the, in the IEC website. So IEC is one organization where you can find out about plenty of standards. You can look information in it, see how you can get the standard, and also see which other projects they have. And um, as the same structure as the patent section we have, uh, 
there are these so-called technical committees, the standard technical committees. And these are organizations and persons that develop the standards. So, for example, liquid biofuels, if you go there and click, then you will have who is actually the secretariat to develop standards for liquid biofuels. And what you can see, for example, um, South America or Africa that has a lot of potential for this technology, they're not participating in elaborate standards. And this is where they can actually have the opportunity to have more of a prominent role in this, um, in this action of uh, developing and also creating new standards. And just to finalize showing you the platform we have, we have come up the latest, the last months with a quality infrastructure model. And this mainly says how quality or how quality can be also a game changer for the technologies. Uh, how you, it's very important for you to to see how your technology will operate, how to make it effective along the 10, 15, 20 years that it will be used. We're deploying plenty of renewables now, but also we have to care about what will happen in the next 10 years, because we're making huge investments and how we're going to actually grant that these technologies will work in 20 years. So this is one of the platforms we have in data about data and information. And uh, I want to show you some examples of information, how you can extract information from Inspire and how you can use it. So on the left, this is the categories for patents in solar PV. And in the, later, in the last five years, there's different innovations happening. So just to exemplify, uh, one of these is uh, roof systems for PV cells. So now you can see that um, roof are coming in the shape of tiles and also working as with solar PV. Another one, uh, PV systems with concentrators. So what it does, it receives the solar radiation and it concentrated in one cell and, and actually is uh, even, it has a very high efficiency. Um, organic PV cells, perhaps you have seen this other innovation happening. This is um, cells that uh, they have a very, they have a very high absorption coefficient of light. So by this, they're very flexible and these are used as well in charging. For example, now you can see backpacks with this kind of cells or you can also see um, chargers for cell phones with this type of cells. And another innovation um, that we can see uh, plenty of activity as well are concerning like um, with charging and discharging in solar PV. So for example, you can have solar PV panels, then you'll have a storage. Then during the day, you actually you, uh, use the, utilize, well, the, you can store the solar uh, energy and then at night, then you can plug, for example, your electric vehicle and utilize it. So this kind of hybrid systems as well is one innovation. Another sector that uh, we wanted to show is about innovative development, developments happening in solar wind. So lately, uh, there was this airborne, a wind turbine that has no down structure. So these go up to 300 meters in the, um, in the sky. And it takes the wind speeds that are even four or, five, four, four or five times more than a normal, what a normal wind turbine could take. Another one, uh, innovations are being seen in what are blades and rotors. So every time blades are being created in a larger size. So we can see as well blades around eight, 80 meters a blade with, uh, with an average of 33 tons. Of per blade. So as you can see, well, this you can see the dimension of the size as of now. And also one mentioned by Francisco was about offshore towers. Also this is a, a, an area where innovation and technological development is happening more. Finally, in the last five years, uh, other developments have happened in uh, what is um, turbines with the axis 
perpendicular to the wind. So this ones they rotate like this. So here is some of the examples. Uh, with Inspire, uh, some of the things that you could do is uh, make comparisons between countries. So in the case of Germany, that has been a, a great case for solar PV. You can compare it to an emerging country like India that right now is starting to implement more and more solar PV. So you can see how patents have been very, very active, well, country, it has, Germany has been a very, very active country since 2007, filling, filing new, or techno, new technological developments. But then in the case of India, you see how it's starting to rise. And then since 2011, 13 patents, then 100 patents, we'll see what will happen in the next years for this country. So just to mention about standards and cover a bit of what is happening in the standards field, uh, we, standards are not just for the renewable energy technologies. We can also see that the standards are following the pace of innovation. So as of now, Inspired has uh, around 400 standards, but there's 100 standards that are related to technologies that will enable more renewable energy. So there are now standards in the Internet of Things, standards in, uh, for example, even in electric vehicles, they're already being developed or standards in hybrid systems, as I mentioned, uh, solar PV with storage. And to say a few words as well about standards, uh, there's already committees that develop standards in blockchain, in uh, batteries for renewable energy, artificial uh, standards for artificial intelligence as well. And then there's other ones that are working as well in hydrogen, with wind energy with floating foundations, and marine energy. So just to finish my part, um, if you are working right now in innovation in renewable energies, you can use Inspire for your data analysis, for your research. All the data that we have is available for free. And as well, if you want to know more about how that technology could be efficient and effective and can last for the years that is expected, you can as well use the standards section in Inspire. And so, well, let's keep with some innovation. No, I was very scared the first time in Germany when I gave a presentation and people start knocking the table. <laughs> and I, 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 I remember now that uh, yeah, this is a good way, so don't be scared, Ale. This is, this is positive. <laughs> Yeah, now, to finalize, maybe we want to say just two more things about policy, because we have discussed about technology and business, but actually policy is crucial to enable these innovations. One is the toolbox of policies that we have to enable the innovation. And actually, we have to think about it in all the stages of the technology life cycle. So you need to think if you in the future work for the government or even a public entity, what would be the best uh, policy to promote innovation in a certain stage of your technology life cycle? You will have to see a little bit at the toolbox and what is the best one. So you can have really technology, what they call the technology push policies, so more R&D, more um, education, PhDs, uh, scientific articles, journals, or if you need more, the market pool. So you have technologies which are closer to commercialization, and what you need is really to scale up. So what you need here is actually, for example, feeding tariff, auctions, and these kind of tools. So important to keep in mind that you need to check into the whole uh, policy toolbox to see what is the best option, depending on the, on the status and technology that you want to deploy in your country. And the second is kind of the summary of today's presentation, we have these maybe four takeaways. The first one is that if we really want to push this energy transformation, you really need to nurture innovation. Without innovation, we will not transform anything. The second one is that energy is two things, no? Or we divide it in two parts today. The electricity or power and the end use sector. So for the power for the power sector, what we have seen is that actually renewable energy technologies exist. 
and are already competitive. We have wind, we have hydro, we have geothermal, we have uh, solar, and all of them already exist, are demonstrated, are competitive. Now the next stage of innovation is integrate these technologies in power systems. And for that, we need these other enabling uh, innovations, storage, electric vehicles, uh, ICT, digitalization, etc., and again, the policy and business models. The third message is on the end use sector. Here, we don't have all the technologies we need yet. So here we still need breakthroughs. And here we need a lot of investment in R&D. How the chemical sector, uh, or the cement sector, for example, will replace the carbon needed to the, or to the calcination of, 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 of clinker. How steel can reduce, or the iron used to produce steel can be reduced without coal, but using other biocarbon. These are things that still need more R&D. And the last one is that, as we said, innovation is not only R&D. Innovation goes much broader than that, is systems operation, system integration, business, regulation, market structures. So basically, these are the four key takeaways that we want to share with you today. And with that, we would like to also invite you to engage. So if you have ideas, new innovations you want to share with us. If you have ideas on how we can improve our work, on what we need to cover in our work program, please contact any of us. So unfortunately, uh, Professor Roche, he is on mission. He was not able to, to, to make it today. But here, I, here is what we call the innovation team. So we have here Alessandra, Arina, myself. Here are our email address. So please feel free to contact us. Also, if you want to get the publications, etc. Just please drop us a line and we'll be very happy to, to work with you. So yeah, of course, thank you. Especially because I think we all are hungry and tired, so thank you so much for staying till the end. Not everyone survived, I saw some ones who, <laughs> who left, but very good, almost everyone. Just to say, in the slide deck that you will receive, you will also get a list of all our publications per technology. So that will be made available uh, with the slide deck that uh, you will get from this uh, presentation today. So yeah, thank you so much. Now we, we still have time for QA? Yeah, we have time. Okay, yeah, we still have time for questions, so please, if you have any question. Ah, yeah, there, there is something innovative about this microphone. So when you, we need to use the microphone, but actually it's not connected to the speakers. So you will not hear your voice louder, but you need to use it because you look cooler if you talk to a microphone, no? If, than if you talk to an air. But actually it's because of, yeah, we are recording it, so you, we need it for the video. I think we are tired. <laughs> Very good. Oh, nice. It's a magic microphone. You hear my voice louder, don't you? Yeah, it's, it's really good. Um, I have a question regarding uh, the hydrogen power. Um, what, are the, what are the most difficult obstacles to not use hydrogen power, uh, hydrogen to store energy? Mm -hmm. Why don't we just, yeah, cut water in half and use it as fuel mm -hmm. for electric batteries? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Very good question. Should we collect any other question before we respond to this one? OK, so hydrogen, that's a very good uh, point. So hydrogen has different aspects. So there was a big boom also in the 80s that, OK, the hydrogen economy is coming, didn't materialize, because of two reasons. One is cost. So it's costly in two terms. So on monetary terms, to actually uh, produce the, the, the hydrogen, and second, in energy terms. So the energy that, that you need to invest to actually produce the hydrogen of course, need to be less than the hydrogen that you, or the energy that you are storing with the hydrogen, right? And the processes that we had in the 80s were very costly in, in both ways, no? 
Now, uh, and, and the, the other aspect is safety. So basically, hydrogen is explosive. No? Here we learned here actually here in Germany with the Zeppelin in, uh, in, in the 19th century. But actually, still there were some issues about uh, leakage of, of hydrogen in, in, in tanks, let's say, which made it extremely dangerous, basically. So it could explode. Yeah? So for example, to have it in the trunk of your car at that time, I don't know, I'm not sure if I want to run with a bomb in the, in the trunk of my car. However, there has been quite some uh, progress now in both areas, so safety and cost. And now what we are seeing is that uh, usually the, the hydrogen is produced through what, what is called a, a steam reform of methane. So actually it's not renewable, it's using fossil fuels. But now the renewable option for hydrogen, which is a, a, um, the, using electrolyzers to actually, through electricity, break up the hydrogen and the oxygen, is becoming much, much cheaper. And now we are seeing actually demonstration plants, so it's actually moving from R&D to the third D, to the demonstration part. So it's getting closer to, to commercialization. And the, the other uh, important aspect is that also in terms of how to manage and store the hydrogen, there have been also important breakthroughs, especially through nanotechnology, on how to design these tanks and, and reservoirs to actually store this hydrogen physically. Yeah? So, Difficult to say if we will see this big hydrogen revolution in the next years, but what I can really tell you is that there is now again a lot of interest from countries to develop hydrogen again as, a, as an option. Very good. Thank you so much, everyone. I hope you enjoy and learn something uh, today. And as I said, please feel free to contact us if you have any further question or just want to share some information or get engaged with us. Thank you.